Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. In West Asia, the situation remains precarious. There were more strikes on Israel today. Western power slapped more sanctions on Iran. Qatar wants to pull out of mediation. The Hamas chief is heading to Turkey and Jordan is seeing protests. In the middle of all of this, Israeli forces are gearing up for the Rafah offensive and Netanyahu has rebuffed his Western allies. We'll bring you detailed reports. Meanwhile, the US is sitting on a debt time bomb. The IMF has issued a warning. America's top bankers are worried. Big drama over Elon Musk's salary. Rejected by court, he wants Tesla shareholders to agree to a $56 billion package. Ahead of voting day in India, the debate over electronic voting machines reaches the top court. In the Maldives, President Muizu under the corruption scanner days before parliamentary elections. What's the first ever law? to protect your brainwave data from sale. Why is the Italian Prime Minister back in Tunisia? What is the new debate that has rocked American basketball and why is Spain struggling with cockroaches? All this and more coming up, the headlines first. India boosts its defence footprint to deliver the first batch of the Brahmo supersonic cruise missiles to the Philippines tomorrow. The over $370 million deal was announced in January 2022. The deal cements India's position as a defence exporter. Germany summons the Russian ambassador after arresting two men on suspicion of spying for Moscow. Berlin says they were planning attacks in Germany, including on US Army targets over its support for Ukraine. After the US, Germany is the second largest donor of military aid to Ukraine. Burkina Faso expels three French diplomats for subversive activities. The officials have to leave the country within 48 hours. France says there were no grounds to expel its diplomats since the coup in 2022. Tensions have been mounting between the African nation and its former colonial master. Croatian party scrambled to form a government in a hung parliament. The ruling Conservative Party, the HDZ, won the most seats but not a majority. The HDZ has been in power in Croatia for most of the time since its independence from Yugoslavia in 1991. And human cases of bird flu are an enormous concern, says the World Health Organization, raising alarm over its growing spread. The current bird flu outbreak began in 2020. It has killed millions of poultry. The mortality rate among humans who have been infected is also very high. Four days since Iran attacked Israel, will Netanyahu strike back? The UK says he will. The EU says we're on the edge of a wider war. Israel on its part is threatening retaliation, but so far it hasn't struck Iran. Instead, it is targeting the proxies and intensifying the fighting with them. Today we saw rockets flying over Israel. There was a fresh exchange of fire with the Hezbollah in Lebanon. This is near Israel's northern border. 14 Israeli soldiers were hurt in today's fighting. Just like Sunday, it was a drone and missile attack. Yesterday, Israeli forces conducted airstrikes. They dropped bombs in southern Lebanon. They killed two Hezbollah commanders. So today, the Hezbollah hit back. And they injured 14 Israeli soldiers. And reports say this has made Israeli forces nervous. This is not their first such exchange with the Hezbollah. So what is different this time? The fact that they can zero in on the whereabouts of Israeli soldiers. The Hezbollah are carrying out targeted strikes. And this could trigger a new wave of violence. Israel going after Iranian proxies, adopting a more aggressive approach until the perceived threats are neutralized. And all of this is making the West nervous. Listen to this. We cannot escalate. We cannot go step by step, answering every time higher to a regional war. I don't want to exaggerate, but we are on the hedge of a war, a regional war. On the edge of a regional war, that was Europe's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell. He says West Asia is on the edge of a regional war, and he's right. What he doesn't say is how the West is pushing the region towards this war by arming Israel and sanctioning Iran. 
Boril and his Western counterparts are raising the temperature. Adopting an expansion of restrictive measures against Iran. I will send to the External Action Service the request to start the necessary work related to these sanctions. The US and the UK announce fresh sanctions on Iran today. They target Iran's drone and missile program. The US has named 16 individuals and two entities. They are believed to be involved in manufacturing the Shahid drones. These dro th th this includes, in fact, this list includes members of the IRGC, that's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. What is the goal of these sanctions? To hurt Iranian manufacturers, to reduce their access to global markets. They may find it hard to procure supplies and to sell their weapons overseas. Uh, the European Union may follow suit. They may also punish Iran for Sunday's attack by squeezing its economy further. But Iran seems undeterred. Sanctions or not, it is issuing fresh threats. <laughs> The plan of action for true promise was a limited operation. It was not a comprehensive and extensive plan. Had the retaliation against Israel been a much larger action, then the supporters of the Zionist regime would have seen that nothing would have remained of the Zionist regime. That was uh, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi saying Tehran could hit Israel harder. The message is intended for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. All eyes are on his next move. And the latest reports suggest that it could be a restrained operation, something which establishes Israeli deterrence, but also reduces the risk of a wider war. That's what the West would like as well. Although publicly, Netanyahu remains in the combative posture. I want to make it clear. We will make our own decisions, and the state of Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself. We make our own decisions. This is what the Israeli Prime Minister said to the foreign ministers of the UK and Germany, David Cameron and Anna Baerbock. They were in Israel yesterday to urge Netanyahu to de-escalate, to not strike Iran. That was their message. And he told them he'll take his own call, like he's doing in Gaza. I'm talking about the Rafah offensive. Despite all warnings from his Western partners, Netanyahu is going ahead with it. Israel has arranged extra weapons to attack Rafah. It's a city in southern Gaza, the last resort for displaced Palestinians. Netanyahu has been planning this offensive for weeks now. The IDF has bought thousands of tents, as many as 40,000 according to one report. These tents could be used to house the evacuees. Israel has also deployed more artillery and armored personnel carriers. There are 1.4 million people in Rafah right now. If Israel strikes, they'll have nowhere to go. Netanyahu is keeping the entire region on edge. So tensions are rising. It's a worry for countries around the world, but more so in West Asia. Many of them are caught in a bind. They cannot support Israel. They cannot support Iran, but they also want peace. Tonight, we're looking at where each of these players stand, starting with Qatar. Most Hamas leaders live in Qatar, in the capital Doha. They get a lot of money from the government. So Qatar plays the role of mediator. They negotiate between Israel and Hamas. And in November, they had some success. Both sides agreed to a brief pause in the fighting. Hamas also released some, some hostages. But a permanent ceasefire has not been achieved. And now Qatar may have had enough. They say their mediation is being abused, so they will re-evaluate their role in the peace talks. Unfortunately, I mean, we have seen that there has been an abuse of this mediation and an abuse of this mediation in favor of narrow political interests. This means that the state of Qatar has called for a comprehensive evaluation of this role. Who is Qatar talking about? could be Israel or the U.S. Benjamin Netanyahu has accused Qatar of funding terrorism. He also threatened to shutter their state-funded news channel Al Jazeera. Even in the U.S., there have been rumbling. Some in the Congress say Qatar is not tough on Hamas. They're not putting enough pressure. So it looks like Doha has had enough. They will re-evaluate their role in the talks. But if Doha walks, walks away, who is left? Egypt is still at the table. They have normal diplomatic relations with Israel, but they do not have much influence over Hamas, not like Qatar does. Then you have Turkey. 
The Turkish foreign minister visited Doha on Wednesday. He held talks with the Hamas leadership. And this Saturday, the Hamas chief will be traveling to Turkey. He is slated to meet President Erdogan. So Ankara does have clout. It can put some pressure on Hamas. Just one problem, though. Erdogan may not use that clout. He is calling the Israeli prime minister bloodthirsty. That's not the language of a negotiator. The number one party responsible for the tension is Netanyahu and his bloodthirsty administration. We believe that any statement that does not recognize this truth will be of no use to efforts to reduce the tension. So who's left? Jordan is one candidate. They have normal relations with Israel. They also have a large Palestinian population. But their government is under pressure. And why is that? Because Jordan indirectly helped Israel. A number of Iranian drones and missiles had flown over Jordanian airspace, so their military shot them down. Jordan shot down Iranian drones heading for Israel. The government says it was self-defense, but the people are not buying it. There are massive anti-government protests. The people say Jordan is betraying the Muslims of Gaza, so the government is under pressure there. They cannot afford to be seen as pro-Israel. Which brings us to the Gulf states. Two of them recognize Israel, Bahrain and the UAE. Bahrain's king is on a regional tour. He's visited Egypt and Jordan. He's called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. We have discussed a number of issues of priority and importance to reinforce the joint Arab work, especially with regards to the implementation of the ceasefire resolution in Gaza and humanitarian aid delivery. Bahrain is a key ally of Saudi Arabia. They do very little without Riyadh support. So is the kingdom looking to play a more prominent role? There are no indications yet. Riyadh's main focus is de-escalation to make sure that Israel and Iran do not go to war. We saw that last weekend. Reports say the Saudis shared intelligence on Iran's attack. Basically, they helped Israel against Iran. But reports also say that they shut their airspace to Israel and the U.S. And this is very important. Israel and the U.S. could have used the Saudi airspace to intercept Iranian drones. But Riyadh said no. Apparently, the UAE did the same. Yes to intelligence sharing, no to opening the airspace. So the message from the Gulf is clear. We will help avoid escalation. But we have our own red lines, and you can see why. Iran's proxies are camping in Yemen, just south of Saudi Arabia. They've already attacked Saudi refineries, so Riyadh does not want to repeat. And honestly, it makes sense. Saudi Arabia and Iran normalized relations only last year. Why would they risk that for Israel? And that's, in fact, the thinking across West Asia. All of them want stability, all of them want de-escalation, but not at the cost of being pro-Israel. And Netanyahu must realize this. Muslim nations may recognize Israel as a geopolitical reality, as a fact of life in West Asia. But they will never embrace Israel, not unless there is a Palestinian state. So Netanyahu must not overplay his hand. He must remember why Muslim nations are doing what they are. Qatar is not mediating out of love for Israel. Jordan is not shooting down drones out of goodwill. And Saudi Arabia is not sharing intelligence to protect Israel. They're doing it for regional stability, to protect their own people and economies from war. Israel would do well to understand that. To the U.S. now, which is bracing for a different kind of explosion. America is sitting on a giant mountain of debt. If it erupts, the consequences would be disastrous. The U.S. has one of the biggest debt piles in the world. The government owes close to $35 trillion. This is bigger than the U.S. economy. America's GDP is around $28 trillion, dollars, and their debt is $35 trillion. Dollars. So America's debt is 123% of its GDP. Clearly, the government is borrowing beyond its means. And it continues to borrow. Whenever the government runs out of cash, it borrows more money. It issues more bonds. But it fails to contain its spending. This is a dangerous trajectory, and now the IMF has sounded an alarm. Going forward, U.S. fiscal deficit is projected to stay elevated, driving debt to ever-rising heights. That pushes up interest rates and the dollar, contributing to tighter funding costs in the rest of the world. Allow me to simplify that. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is telling the U.S. that it cannot keep borrowing without limits. 
also because this has consequences for the whole world. America's rising debt is pushing up interest rates around the world. It is also raising the cost of loans. So the US will have to find a way to tame its borrowing because it poses a risk to global financial stability and that is the warning from the IMF. Which brings us to the question, why is it coming now? Why did the IMF not raise this earlier and why are they doing it now? Because earlier, America's debt was considered safe. And for good reason. The US has never defaulted on its loans. It has the world's biggest currency, the USD, which is also the world's reserve currency. And this allowed the US, the US government to get away with a lot. But today, US debt looks risky. And one major reason for that is the interest. Let me show you some numbers from last month. Every 100 days, the US has added $1 trillion to its debt. In other words, every three months, America's debt has increased by a trillion dollars, so much so that now their interest payments are bigger than their defense budget. This year alone, the US will pay $870 billion as interest on loans. $870 billion is the interest. Do you know what their defense budget is? $822 billion. And this high interest on loans is increasing America's debt. It's a bit like getting a home loan. Say you borrow money to buy an apartment. Now, most home loans come with a floating interest rate, meaning they can fluctuate depending upon the economic climate. The interest rate goes up or down. So you start repaying the loan. After paying your EMIs for a few years, you check your loan account only to be shocked. You will find that your debt has hardly reduced. You've been paying your EMIs on time, yet you have a significant debt burden after years of payment because the bank has been recovering the interest all this while. And this is a classic debt trap situation. When you borrow a large amount, your income does not rise and the interest fluctuates. When all of these three things happen, chances are your debt, debts will increase. And the US government is in a similar situation. Top American bankers are concerned, like Jamie Dimon, of the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, or Brian Moynian, the CEO of Bank of America, and BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. They're all concerned about America's growing debt. Also, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, consider what he said earlier this year. I'm quoting, it's now time or past time to get back to an adult conversation among elected officials about getting the federal government back on a sustainable fiscal path. And this advice makes sense. He wants the US government to reduce expenses and find ways to increase its income and start reducing its debt pile. This is common sense, but so far Washington has not been able to move in this direction. They don't even seem inclined to. Every year, Democrats and Republicans clash with each other over the debt limit. That's the legal borrowing limit for the US government, the debt, the de debt ceiling. Every year, the US government finds itself on the brink of a shutdown. There's a clash over this debt ceiling. And after a few rounds of back and forth, they always resort to more debt to keep America running. American politicians seem to have only one strategy, run their government by borrowing more. But going forward, they will have to course correct and contain the debt because the stability of the US economy and potentially the global economy depends on it. Speaking of billions and trillions, that's how much Tesla wants to pay its CEO. I'm talking about Elon Musk. Tesla shareholders are preparing to vote on his pay package. Guess how much it's worth? $56 billion. It would be the biggest payday in US history. Now there's, there's a lot of background here. Elon Musk does not draw a salary from Tesla. He owns 20% of the company. He also works as a CEO, but he doesn't take a salary or bonus. Instead, in 2018, he proposed a different idea. What if he was paid based on Tesla's performance? The shareholders set 12 different targets, like X amount of sales and Y amount of profits and revenue. Each time one target was hit, Musk would get more Tesla stock. How much? Around 1% of it, which works out to 56 billion over several years. 56 billion dollars. But in 2018, some shareholders opposed it in court. They raised a couple of important points. A, they did not know how easy these targets were. Maybe Tesla expected to hit them anyway. 
in which case paying Musk made no sense. And B, why does Musk need extra incentive? He owns 20% of the company, so if Tesla does well, he automatically profits. And the judge agreed. A court in Delaware invalidated the pay deal. It said the shareholders had not been properly consulted. Perhaps they were starstruck by Elon Musk. But now that deal is back on the table. Tesla shareholders will meet in the month of June. They will vote again on Musk's pay package. They will also vote on shifting Tesla's headquarters. Right now, the company is incorporated in the state of Delaware. A Delaware judge had blocked Musk's pay, and that has infuriated him. So he now wants to shift Tesla to Texas. It's a Republican rule state, one that is more friendly to Elon Musk. But let's look at the larger picture here. Is Elon Musk worth $56 billion to Tesla? Is any CEO worth what they're paid? Let's look at the company's performance. Tesla shares were trading at almost $250 in the month of January. And now it's around $155. So Tesla stock is 37% down this year. Also 15% down compared to last April. And it doesn't end there. Tesla has also lost its electric vehicle crown. For years, Musk's company was the biggest producer of EVs in the world. But last year, BYD overtook them, the Chinese company. They made more EVs than Tesla. Now, you could blame this on multiple factors like rising inflation, rising lending rates, and a general economic lull. But experts also blame Elon Musk for this. He made himself synonymous with Tesla. So when he does something problematic, Tesla's brand also suffers. Whether it's his random Twitter rants, or flirting with anti-Semitism, or siding with hardline politicians in the US. So to recap, Tesla shares are down. Their sales have fallen for the first time ever. They have recalled some 360,000 cars, and they're being sued for their unsafe self-driving cars. But Elon Musk wants $56 billion in pay, and that too in the middle of job cuts. Tesla is laying off 10% of its global workforce. That's almost 11,000 jobs. In fact, 14,000 jobs. And yet the company wants to pay billions to Musk. How does any of this make sense? Well, that's the point. It doesn't. Most CEO compensations are mind-boggling. Let's look at the US first. CEOs at top companies earn around $15 million. That's the annual average, $15 million. And what about the people who work for them? They can make $15 million by working for 185 years. Imagine the gap. It's equally bad here in India. Since the pandemic, CEO compensation has increased by 40%. The average is now around 14 crore rupees, which is around $1.6 million. But the salary of junior workers has not increased as quickly. It rose by around 20%, which is half of the CEOs. What workers earn in a year, CEOs earn in four hours. And it's not getting better. In 1965, CEOs made 20 times what their workers did, and now they make 350 times what their workers do. So the gap is only widening. The question is why? Many CEOs are now paid in stock options and bonuses, so when the market booms, their compensation rises. Some also say it's market forces. If companies are willing to pay millions, it's because CEOs are worth it. How strange, though. When the same companies crash, the CEOs lose nothing. They walk away with millions in severance pay. It's only the average worker who loses her job. Now, don't get us wrong. We are not saying that CEOs should not be paid enough or should be paid like other workers. Each job has, a, has its own skill level. Each job also has its own responsibility. For example, when a Tesla self-driving car crashes, the workers are not affected. But Elon Musk will be dragged to the US Congress, and he will face legal charges. But does that justify 56 billion in payments? We'd like to hear from you. Just hours to go for the largest election in history to begin. 
We're talking about a mammoth exercise, almost a billion voters, more than 2,600 parties and almost 1 million polling stations. It doesn't matter who you support. Tomorrow is about celebrating democracy in India, about going out and casting your vote. Of course, this is just the first phase of polling. There are seven phases in total. This one has 102 seats in 21 states. But amid all the excitement, there is also apprehension, mostly about EVMs, electronic voting machines. This is what they look like. All candidates are listed with their name and party symbol. Every candidate has a button alongside their name. To vote, you must press it. That's how the machine works. But some NGOs and activists are not happy. They have filed a petition at the Supreme Court, India's top court. It broadly seeks two things. One, to go back to using ballot papers, and two, to verify votes with a paper trail. Thankfully, the courts have rejected the first demand, but the second one is still being heard. During the trial, the petitioners raised a worrying report. An EVM trial was held in Kerala. The machine apparently registered extra votes for the BJP, so the court asked the Election Commission for an explanation. The poll body said it was fake news. But the paper trail question remains. Petitioners say there should be 100% cross-verification of the vote and the paper trail. How do you do that? With VV Pats. It stands for Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail, VVPAT, VV Pat. Every polling booth has VV Pat machines. It is attached to the EVMs. When you vote, the VV Pat machine prints a slip. It has the candidate serial number, their name and their party symbol. You can see this slip briefly on the machine, but you can't take it home. The idea is to improve transparency, to show the voter where the vote went. And what does the Election Commission do with these slips? Some of them are cross-checked. Poll officers will randomly select five polling stations in every assembly constituency. In those stations, the votes and VV paths will be matched, just to ensure that it's all fine. But the petitioners say that's not enough. There must be 100% verification, meaning every vote must be matched with the VV Pat. And what does the EC have to say? They say it's unnecessary. More than 40 million, 40, 40 million VV Pats have been cross-checked in all elections. There have been zero instances of mismatch. So the EC is asking, what's the point? Plus, it could delay the election results. It takes one hour to match VV Pats with one EVM. And India has tens of thousands of EVMs. So the result could be delayed by five or six days. Also, the Election Commission swears by these EVMs. They say it's impossible to tamper with, N with it at any stage. Either way, the court has heard all the arguments. It has also reserved its judgment. So now we have to wait. But chances are the court will not order radical changes. That's what history suggests. Most Indian courts have defended the electronic voting machines, especially because the judges know what used to happen. Listen to what one of the Supreme Court judges said. Fortunately, we are now in our 60s. We have seen what used to happen earlier. Have you forgotten that? If you have forgotten that, I'm sorry. What is the judge talking about? The era of poll rigging. Ballots would be stuffed with fake votes, entire polling stations would be captured, and real ballots would disappear. The EVMs did fix those problems. They have made our election process fast and reliable. Is there room for improvement? Of course there is, there always is. But is election eve the right time for that? I guess the courts will decide. Our next story is from the Maldives. It's about their president, Mohamed Muizu. The famously anti-India, pro-China, Maldivian leader, Muizu has come under pressure this week over allegations of corruption. An anonymous Twitter user leaked some documents prepared by the Maldives Monetary Authority, by their Financial Intelligence Unit, or FIU. Now, normally this wouldn't be a big deal. Random allegations on social media purportedly showing a six-year-old report. But this is not a normal time. The revelation comes just days before elections. Maldivians will vote for their parliament on Sunday. So Muizu's opposition has latched upon these corruption allegations. Some are even demanding Muizu's impeachment. Here's our report. This is Mohamed Muizu, the president of the Maldives. 
He became president in November last year, but he's been in politics for a while now. Muizu has served as the mayor of Mali, that's the capital of the Maldives. Before that, he was a cabinet minister, the minister of housing and infrastructure. For over 12 years, Muizu has been a senior political figure, which means he's no stranger to controversy or corruption allegations. Muizu was housing minister until 2018, in charge of allocating projects to companies. He was under the scanner for potential corruption, especially after his political party lost the presidency in 2018. But since Muizu was never hauled to court, no one knew what the investigative agencies were looking at until now. An anonymous ex-user put out some documents on Monday, documents from the Financial Intelligence Unit of the Maldives Monetary Authority. The ex-user levelled some explosive allegations. The documents purportedly show suspicious activity from Muizu's personal bank account. The user claims it is proof of Muizu's corruption. Now, no one should take random revelations on social media at face value. But here's the difference. The Maldivian government does not claim that the documents are fake. Muizu admitted that they are real. He added a caveat though. He says it was a draft report, so it's not the final cut. The draft report shows that Muizu was once under the scanner. It was reportedly prepared in 2018, after Muizu's stint as Housing and Infrastructure Minister. The report says Muizu received money from various companies. US dollars were sent to his account. Look at the names. Sun Siam Resorts Limited. They paid Muizu a million Maldivian rufia. That's a resort company paying a million to a country's housing and infrastructure minister. It wasn't the only company though. There are some interesting foreign entities as well. Like Windrun HK International Trading Limited, Hunan Ruin Trading Company Private Limited, and Hunan No. 6 Engineering Company Limited. All of them are Chinese companies, and the last name stands out. Hunan No. 6 Engineering was awarded a government contract in 2017. It was contracted to build the Sinamale Bridge Highway while Muizu was Housing and Infrastructure Minister. On a side note, the Sinamale Bridge was originally known as the China-Maldives Friendship Bridge. So what exactly is the friendship between Muizu and China? And did this so-called friendship play a part in Muizu's present anti-India sentiment? Muizu says the report doesn't bother him. He believes it is a political ploy by his opponents on the eve of a parliamentary election. The country goes to polls on Sunday. The 93-member parliament is presently controlled by the opposition. Muizu says the report's timing is questionable, but will the people of the Maldives buy his defence? Our next story is about you. What makes you who you are? It's how you process things, how you think, decide, react and remember. One can argue it's all about the brain. The human brain is where our memories are stored. All the information that we've ever gathered, every thought that shapes the way we behave. Now with this in mind, what do you think about privacy? The right to your private thoughts, the ability to keep a secret. This should be a basic human right, but in most places it's not. Because these days, technology can read your thoughts. Sensors can map your brain waves. They can detect spikes in neural activity. Basically, some products can read your mind. And the companies behind these products can then sell this information. That's right, firms can legally sell your brainwave data. Because most places do not have laws governing this. But that has just changed in one place the state, the U.S. state of Colorado. Colorado passed a new law yesterday. It has expanded the definition of sensitive data. Now, this includes neural data from the, from the brain, spinal cord, and even nerves. All these parts of your body generate data in the form of electric signals. And now these electric signals will become private property in Colorado. All these devices that monitor brain activity, headbands that help track anxiety, fitness apps that measure your sleep cycles, earphones that promise enhanced tech-aided meditation experiences, Pro Max, whatever the device, if it monitors brain waves, this data is now private. At least in the US state of Colorado, before this new law, it was the wild west when it came to brain data. Any of these companies could have sold your brain data. Feeling happy and refreshed after a jog, your headband could sell this data to a juice company. Feeling tired after a long day at work, your earphones could inform an antidepressant company. Have a winning hand at poker? 
Well, you can forget about your poker face. Your fitness band will sense your joy and it may sell you out for a price. You get the picture. Your inner thoughts, your private emotions, even your imagination, technology can read all of it like a book and big tech is waiting to monetize all of this as well. You may think I'm being alarmist, but let me show you a report. It's from a few months ago. Apple filed a patent for a next generation airport sensor system. The patent background mentions brain activity. Apple will be monitoring it by placing electrodes on a user, specifically on your ears. And these sensors will always be active, whether you're using a specific monitoring app or not. What do you think that's for? If there are no laws against it, what stops Apple or anyone else from harvesting your brain data and selling it to the highest bidder? Then there are the most invasive device makers, the brain chip companies like Elon Musk's Neuralink. These chips can provide great benefits, help people overcome disabilities, but they also have direct access to your brain and all the thoughts that lie within. What guarantee is there that this data won't be auctioned off? Colorado's law is the need of the hour. It's not to counter some future threat because brain data collection is already happening. Without guardrails, all your personal thoughts are up for sale. Colorado has implemented some much needed guardrails. This new law will allow people to access their brain data. They can access, delete or correct it and they can stop the sale of their data for targeted advertising. Companies have already admitted to doing this. They share brain data with third parties. If it's your brain data, your thoughts, dreams and personalities, you should have control over it. Now this law is inspiring similar laws in other American states, but this cannot just be a Western protection. The rest of us need these laws too. Hopefully our politicians feel the same. Our next story is from the Mediterranean Sea, or rather two countries on either side of it, Italy and Tunisia. These two nations are in the middle of a storm, a wave of illegal immigration. Italy is, entering, is the entry point to Europe for a lot of migrants. Tunisia is often their African exit ramp. So Italy has been trying to shut the gates by showering Tunisia with funds. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney was back in Tunisia this week. It was her fourth visit in the past year. She signed three new agreements with Tunisia, promising them over $100 million in both cash and credit. Here's our report. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni was on an important visit. She took a short trip across the Mediterranean to the North African nation of Tunisia. It's a familiar destination for Meloni. She's been going to Tunisia quite frequently to hold talks with the country's president, Kais Saied. This is Meloni's fourth trip over the last year, and she made this announcement after her meeting. Oggi abbiamo firmato Today we signed three very important agreements, a deal to provide direct support to the Tunisian budget, a new line of credit for Tunisian small and medium-sized enterprises, and a framework agreement for cooperation in the university and higher education sectors. Cash, credit and scholarships. That is what Meloni is offering Tunisia. How much? 50 million euros in cash, directly to Tunisia's state coffers. Officially, it's to promote renewable energy projects. Then there's the credit. Italy will extend a 55 million euro credit line, officially to support Tunisia's small and medium enterprises. So Italy is giving Tunisia 105 million euros. That's about 112 million dollars. What's the reason for this generosity? Clearly, this cooperation has been yielding many results. I want to thank the Tunisian authorities for the work that we are jointly carrying out against human traffickers. Clearly, we know that Tunisia cannot become the destination country for migrants arriving to the rest of Europe. Italy is basically paying Tunisia to deal with its immigration problem. Italy received almost 156,000 migrants last year. That's almost 50% more than in 2022. Most of these migrants took off from North Africa in rickety boats, risking life and limb to find a better life for themselves. Often, the first port of call is Italy, the tiny Italian island of Lampedusa. It's closer to Tunisia than it is to Italy. And thousands of migrants land here every year. 
Italy has struggled to house these migrants. So instead, Meloni wants to stop the migrants before they set off. That is where Tunisia comes in. Meloni hopes that by showering funds on Tunisia, the country will thank her by stopping the migrants. There's an obvious problem with this plan, though. What happens if Italy stops sending money? What happens if Tunisia starts asking for a bigger cut? Their president is Kai Saied. He's been accused of subverting democracy, of expanding his presidential powers. What happens if he needs more money from Italy to realize his vision? He knows that he can hold a sword to Europe's neck. Is the EU comfortable giving him that much power? Meloni does have a bigger plan. She plans to invest 5.5 billion euros in the African continent. She is hoping that this will spur development and incentivize some African migrants to stay in their home countries. But people don't just leave their countries for economic reasons. They also leave because of political repression, the kind Kai Saied champions. So is Meloni's Tunisia outreach short-sighted? Is she spending hundreds of millions to create an even bigger problem? Are you happy with your salary? Whether you say yes or no, chances are you'd be livid if you learn this. You make less than 1% of what your counterpart does. They make 137 times your salary for doing exactly the same work. Now, no matter your salary, would you be okay with something like that? The scenario seems unbelievable, but that's exactly what has happened to Caitlin Clark. She's an American basketball star. So far, she's played women's college basketball, dominated it, and lifted it to new heights. She has helped it achieve a landmark year. Clark is the top scorer in the American college basketball history. And now she's gone pro with the WNBA, that's the US Women's National Basketball Association, the counterpart of NBA or National Basketball Association, which is for the male players. Now these are two of the most electrifying basketball leagues in the world. This week, the Women's League held their annual team selection. And Clark was the first draft pick, which is supposed to be a, re a really big deal. So how much will she be paid for it? About $77,000. And why is that a problem? To understand that, let me give you some context. The top NBA pick, the male player, will make $10.5 million. The top women's league pick is $77,000. So Clark will earn less than 1% of what her male counterpart will make in the first year. And this is not even the worst part of it. Forget NBA players. Clark's salary is lower than some NBA mascots. What these mascots make in one year, Clark won't be able to make even in five. The pay disparity is staggering. And this is not just about one player. This is about the whole game. Let me show you some more numbers. This is what the highest paid woman made last year in basketball. And this is the highest paid man, more than $50 million. Let alone the highest pay, the minimum salary in the men's league is over a million dollars. So the entire women's league combined will get about the same as one random male player. Fans are outraged. So is U.S. President Joe Biden, apparently. He says, right now we're seeing that even if you're the best, women are not paid their fair share. It's not technically new information. And what has he done as president to fix this trend? Also, when we discuss sport and pay disparity, the usual argument is about popularity and viewership. Men's sports are watched more, so male players earn more. Well, here's the thing. The Women's Basketball T League has seen tremendous growth increasing attendance and soaring TV ratings. Last season's finals saw a 20-year high in viewership, but of course the men's league, the NBA, is way more popular, it brings in more revenue, so the men's league can pay more to their players. And the female players know this. So they're not asking for equal pay. What they're asking for is fairness. Women receive around 10% of the league's overall revenue, and men, they get 50% of the NBA revenue. So this pay gap is an institutional problem. And it is not limited to American basketball. It applies to all kinds of sports across most nations. Look at golf. An average male athlete makes more than a million dollars per annum. A female athlete makes less than $350,000. Or tennis. 
An average male player in tennis makes about one and a half million dollars. A female player makes about one million. And this is the average. Now look at the richest players across sports. Let me show you how the numbers stack against each other. On the left is, is the list of the highest paid male players in 2022. On the right, the highest paid female players. So whichever way you look at it, there is a glaring disparity. Fortunately, in the past few years, we've also seen some change. For instance, the US football decided to equalize pay in 2022. The same year, India brought pay parity in cricket. Same for male and female players, as did New Zealand. And in 2023, England joined the club. So there is progress, but if we think this is good enough, we've really dropped the ball. Our last story is about Spain. It's notorious for its conquests in history, but now the country faces a new kind of invasion. It's led by the humble cockroach. Roaches are on the rise in, in Spain. Cockroach infestations are up by 33% since last year, so much so that it could turn into a public health issue. And they've tried everything apparently, including in insecticides, but nothing seems to work because cockroaches are immune to poisons. Why is that? Why are more and more insects becoming resistant to what once killed them. Our next report tells you. In the sun-soaked lands of Spain, siestas are sacred. But what if you woke up from your nap to an intruder? A six-legged uninvited guest, one that scuttles through the shadows, disrupting your peace and tranquility. I'm talking about the cockroach. Spain has a rampant roach problem and it's only getting worse. Cockroach infestations are on the rise in Spain. They're up by almost 33% since last year. Leading this wave is the German cockroach. They are in residential buildings, they're in commercial establishments, food joints, roadsides. Turn your head in Spain and you may just spot a roach. So much so that cockroach races could replace bullfights. This is worrying Spaniards. They believe it could become a serious public health issue. So how did these cockroaches become so rampant? The answer could be climate change. Spain was known for its subtropical climate. It was not, but not so hot. But then came global warming. And since then, the country has transitioned to a tropical climate. Days are hotter, summers are longer, and that means cockroaches have more time to breed. Plus, they've also become more resilient. These cockroaches are insecticide resistant. That means sprays, chemicals, poisons, none of that works. They're like mutant cockroaches. They can survive almost anything. And this isn't just a Spanish problem, it's a problem across the globe. Cockroaches are an ancient group dating back to almost 280 million years. So they've seen everything. They've outlived dinosaurs, gone through multiple evolutions. This has made them multi-resistant and really hard to kill. And it's a problem with insects across the globe. Remember Paris last year? It was bedbug central. From motels to metros, these tiny insects were everywhere. Bedbugs were eradicated from France in the 1950s. But last year they were back, with both vengeance and resistance to insecticides. So how are so many insects becoming resistant to the things that once killed them? The answer lies in evolution. Due to continued exposure to insecticides, some roaches could be born with resistance. They can survive chemicals, while others can't. So when they're hit with insecticides, those that are resistant survive. Then they give birth to more such pests. And at the end of the day, you have a population that's suddenly resistant to insecticides. So what's the solution to this? Climate change is making pest and bug infestation more rampant. There are more roaches, more bed bugs, which poses a unique problem to pest controllers. They now have to abandon their old methods and try new solutions like mechanical traps and artificial sweeteners. Turns out, sugar isn't just bad for you, it does no good to roaches either. But how long before they become resistant to this as well and come back to bug us? And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Indonesia, a volcanic eruption triggered a tsunami warning leading to the evacuation of thousands. In the United States, an elephant was on the loose in the state of Montana after it escaped from a circus. And... 
353 ballerinas broke the world record for dancing on their tiptoes in one place. Finally, taking you back in history, on this day in 1980, Zimbabwe gained independence from the UK after 90 years of colonial rule. The country was briefly ruled by a white minority in the 1960s and 70s, but a civil war ended in complete independence. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Karena material batu dari gunung sudah. Ada pukul 19.56.